Good morning, everybody. I see some people starting to stream in. We're just going to give it a couple minutes and let everybody uh, get on the call. Uh, so hopefully everyone's having a great Thursday morning. It's Friday Eve. I know we're all excited. I see I see Brandon and Daryl and Neil. Morning, everybody. So for those just joining, we're going to give it a couple more minutes and just let everybody kind of fill in here. And we'll probably get started in about two minutes. So if you've got an instant coffee machine, you still got time. But you won't need the caffeine because it's great content today. Oh, shit. I'm pumping myself up with caffeine. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that foreshadows uh, uh, the, the energy level for the, <laughs> the conference, but I'll be wired. So, uh, all right. Love it. All right. More people streaming in. Morning, everybody. We're just giving it a couple minutes here and then we will get started. All right. Well, Dave, what do you think? You want to kick this off? One, yeah, because otherwise people will get bored and start signing off. So let's get <laughs> and, and we'll, we'll hold trick questions for the people that are, are, are late. That's right. That's right. You're going to have to remember the first 30 seconds of this presentation if you want to get your door prize at the end. Right. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I'm Matt Amundsen with Scale Venture Partners. I'm joined today by Dave Brock. Uh, we're going to be talking about uncovering sales leverage points. Uh, we're going to be talking about some, uh, some changes that are going on in the market that I'm sure you guys are all experiencing in your day to day, some solutions for um, you know, how to do things the right way, given all that's happening in the sort of macroeconomic climate and specifically, you know, what's, uh, what's been going on uh, in, in the sales realm. So um, if you guys are unfamiliar with me, uh, or if you, uh, if, if you haven't met me before, my name is Matt Amundsen. I am an executive in residence here working on the scale platform team. Um, so a little bit about the scale platform team. Hold on, let me just move us forward. So we help build, uh, we help our portfolio build and optimize hyper growth go to market machines. Um, and we range from folks that work in uh, marketing like myself uh, to folks that work in sales. And today's presentation is all about sales. Uh, which leads me into, you know, what do we do? What does the the scale platform team do? So um, we do host uh, quite a few educational and networking events, uh, both in uh, in person as well as virtual. Um, we create content like what you're about to see today, uh, you know, in the form of of um, of webinars, but also in um, in, in, in um, you know, worksheets that you guys can take and sort of bring into your organization. Uh, we also provide advisory if, uh, if you need help, you know, building a new sales process or optimizing your sales process. Um, we have people here who can step in uh, and guide you through the services that we provide. And we also have uh, an extended go-to-market network uh, full of some of the brightest minds in, in go-to-market, sort of illustrative uh, of the organizations that are listed here um, who can you know meet with you uh, as a very uh, with deep uh, subject matter expertise or you know if you'd like to work with them on an extended basis uh, we can arrange the the the, the um, uh, that service for you as well so I'm personally thrilled I know I, I I was talking to to Dave a little bit before we before we got going but I have been a follower and admirer of Dave Brock for a number of years, uh, you know, both in 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 his speaking uh, and also in the content that he creates in social uh, and in the written word. So, if you're unfamiliar with Dave, uh, he is a founder 
uh, and CEO of Partners in Excellence. Uh, he's the author of the Sales Manager Survival Guide. Um, if you guys haven't picked up this book, I would highly recommend it. Uh, there was a time, even though I am a marketer, there was a time where uh, where I managed uh, some salespeople in my career, and I was recommended this this book by uh, by Craig Rosenberg, and I, I picked it up and I read it, and I utilized a lot of the lessons within. Uh, and and so what is what does Dave do uh, aside from just creating all this content, speaking publicly, and and writing books? Uh, he's a strategic consultant to Fortune 500 organizations, so some of the biggest and best companies in the world who are kind of leading uh, uh, some of the most complex uh, sales cycles out there. So he's worked with 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 many of those and brings a whole wealth of experience to this conversation. So. Uh, Dave, I hope that was a, a decent enough uh, introduction to you, um, but I'll let I'll I'll let you uh, sort of introduce yourself as well. Well, I'll, I'll have to live up to that. I hope I can live up to it. Thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, uh, a lot of you uh, know me through a lot of my LinkedIn presence, and I, I I am you know sometimes fairly controversial, and sometimes inflict my sick uh, sense of humor on people in LinkedIn and. Uh, and I will inflict it on, on you, Matt, and the audience. Uh, but my background is primarily with very, very large corporations. I have, it's it, not many people know it, but I have been part of the founding team of a couple of very successful startups. So I do have some startup um, um, experience. Uh, there's a, a software company headquartered in Paris right now called Deso Systems. Its market cap is about 60 billion. But I joined it, it running its uh, North American sales and marketing when there were 12 people. And we grew it up and, uh, and did some wonderful things. And then a I founded a another AI-based software company in Paris in 2002. Ultimately, I sold it to uh, Dasso, and it's part of their product portfolio now. So uh, in a lot of our clients, we have kind of a bimodal distribution. While I think most of our revenue comes from very, very large corporations, most of actually my personal excitement comes from working with early stage, say, ABC, uh, D stage companies because we get to experiment with a lot of new ideas in those companies and then take them to the larger companies and start scaling them quite a bit. And in fact, some of the ideas that we'll be talking about today came from that kind of experience of experimenting with, with earlier stage companies because they're smaller, we can move faster and, and see results much more quickly. And then we start scaling it into very, very large companies. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are joined by both uh, both small and large organizations today. So I think that there's a ton that they're going to be able to take away from today's presentation. Um, you know, I, I I have so many questions that that I want to ask you personally, but I, I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to kind of take us through the process. Um, uh, I think in general, you know, what I see... In, out in the market is there is a lot of um, there's a lot of discussion around the concept of the playbook and should we be returning to a playbook uh, if we're hiring a new sales leader does that person have you know a, a, a quote unquote wartime playbook you know given given all the complexities and go to market right now um, is our old playbook not working do we need a new playbook like how should salespeople be, and specifically sales leaders, be thinking about this, you know, in 2023? Yeah, yeah. And that's, it's interesting. I read, I'm a big fan of John Miller. And John wrote something really interesting the other day, really from a marketing point of view and from his perspective, you know, both with Marketo and then uh, 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 now demand base and all of that, is he said the playbook's broken. You know, and, and now when the playbook's broken, what do we do? How do we start discovering where we go? How do we start building business and, and things like that? I've been writing some articles recently and a number of kind of fellow consultants, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Aaron Evans in the UK, uh, and I kind of talk about outbound is broken. Mm -hmm. uh, if outbound is broken, what in, in inbound isn't driving enough business volume, what do we do? How do we change? What are the new approaches? 
And so this is really kind of a tipping point that actually I find really exciting because yeah. it's a chance for us to really reinvent ourselves and start um, identifying new ways to grow. I mean, new ways to think about growing all based on the, the same fundamental principles. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think if you're hearing marketers start saying things like, hey, the old way of doing things isn't working, it's only natural for that to sort of dovetail into the need for a new sales process as well, or at the very least, a sales process that's lock and step with what marketing is doing in terms of changing their top of funnel approach. So, well, and, and to me, it's astounding that marketing would be saying things are broken because usually they're the last to recognize those things. <laughs> Yep, uh, that that can. No, be, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that, but that it can it can be the case. I think, like you know, uh, not to not to lead too much, but I do think that there is uh, there's been a massive over rotation in terms of uh, just the sort of demand capture area. Just trying to every lead, let's try to turn that into a meeting as opposed to um, you know spending the time and effort and allocating resources to do demand creation, which is like how do we actually make a market before we try to bring those people into our funnel. Yeah, yeah, super. All right, well, let's let's hop into it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide us forward here, if I can, there we go. So take us through the sales effectiveness framework. So let me give you a little bit of background around how the sales effectiveness framework has kind of evolved and, um, and why we developed it. It first started when I wrote a sales manager survival guide, people would go through all our training programs and things like that. And they say, I get it, I understand it. Now, what do I do? And they were struggling at the time with having, you know, saying, you know, how do I identify what the big performance management levers are for my team? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I understand, you know, whether it's, Anisha, what should I be coaching you on? Uh, Matt, what should I be coaching you on? Uh, so on and so forth is, is, is how do I identify it? And so what we started doing is, is we realized that people didn't understand the interrelationship between kind of the pieces, parts of, of the whole sales job, even if we were uh, divided so that we have maybe SDRs and BDRs at the front end, AEs, and so on and forth, so forth. We didn't know how everything got put together. You know, so fast forward today, we've been working on this sales effectiveness framework, but now we're starting to see, and originally it was designed around how do we in, uh, identify performance levers for individual performance? Hmm. But now as the world is changing, we're starting to look at it how do we identify performance levers for organizational performance and organizational change? Is everything's changing? Where do we have the biggest opportunity to, to change what we do organizationally to continue to support our growth and, and that kind of thing? So we started developing this and it's very, it, it's, there's nothing magical about it. But, but what we really started helping people understand is how kind of the pieces, parts of this stuff fit together and, 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 and how to start looking at the interconnection between these. So it, it's kind of like, you know, if I, if I tweak on, say, uh, the buying and selling process, it actually ripples forward and backwards to your account management, to your territory coverage, to even your meeting management and meeting execution and through your pipeline. Or if I look at, you know, tweaking something in my pipeline management process, you know, actually what it has, I have some customers right now where we're tweaking their pipeline management process and it has major implications for their account growth and account penetration. Can you can you double click there for a second when you say yeah. you're tweaking it and it's having major implications? What are you tweaking and what are the implications that, that it's having? So let, let's dive into some examples and also probably, and I'll dive into some fairly simple examples if you're getting started using this framework. And then I'll look at some examples right now where 
we're having some clients, you know, make major changes in win rates, sales cycle, and account penetration. Um, and also, so let's say the easiest place to start in terms of diagnosing things is usually at the pipeline. And let's say, Matt, you and I are both salespeople. Yeah. And we both have $5 million quotas. We both have $10 million pipelines. You have, our deal sizes are roughly the same. You have a 40% win rate and I have a 20% win rate. So yeah. I'm, I'm on my way to President's Club and you know, you're know you going to Vice President's Club. So if, if I get to that. So, <laughs> so, so you know, usually I, I just, I'm speaking and I pose this to uh, hundreds of managers and I'd say, what do you do? And the first thing everybody says, top of funnel, more prospecting, you got to fill your funnel. You know, you got to, and some of them go back to that old adage, you need to have three X pipelines. So you have to build your pipeline up to 15 million. Yeah. And I say, well, no, actually that's not the right answer. Mm. So if you look at it, Matt is a pretty good salesperson. If I force Matt to build 3X pipeline, I'll divert Matt, I'll divert you from doing deals. You only need a $12.5 million pipeline. And if I force you to go out and do put 15, I'll rob you of time that you need to really be as good a salesperson as you are in closing the deals. Mm -hmm. So my coaching for you, Matt, as a manager would be, you know, prospecting and how you might find that extra two and a half million of pipeline without distracting you too much from doing deals. But I look at Dave, Dave sucks. I mean, <laughs> big time. You know, Dave is so bad as a salesperson that imagine how terrible he's going to be. I'm going to be at prospecting. So first, if I get, if I somehow magically get to a fifteen million dollar pipeline, that's not enough. Yeah, I need quite a bit more to make my number. But if I'm so bad at doing deals, I'm going to be even worse at prospecting. So one, my pipeline quality will probably plummet. Two is the brand impact I have of you know me going out there trying to prospect and say, buy my product, buy my product and casting as wide a net as possible is going to have a really adverse brand impact. Mm. So rather than telling me to go out and work on top of the pipeline, the best thing to do is try and say, what are the things that you can do, Dave, to start getting to be as good as, as Matt is? How can we improve your win rate? So if I start improving my win rate and improving me in terms of how I manage deals and win deals, one is I become a much better salesperson. So I'm likely to become much better at prospecting. Two is my whole pipeline dynamics change and what I need to do to be successful changes very dramatically. If I, if I without that change, I would probably continue being very, very unsuccessful mm. uh, in be, being a real drag on the organization. And while that's it, when you say it, it seems so obvious. Sure. But the problem is, is most people don't do that. Well, I think, you know, speaking from, from a marketer's perspective, oftentimes what, you know, I hear, uh, you know, from either a manager that's managing a group that's underperforming or an individual contributor that's underperforming is I just need more top of the funnel, which, you know, it's sure we, we want to fill your pipeline as much as humanly possible. Um, but I, I, I do tend to, to lean into your thought process, which is like, hey, look, this is a team effort. Yes, I will get you more pipeline. I'll do everything in my power to get you more pipeline. But, you know, what are the things that we can do as a sales organization that actually can improve our win rate? Because we know if we go from, say, a 25% win rate to a 30% win rate, it has a massive impact on, on net new ARR. And, and see, that's one, one of the things that I'm seeing right now as I work with organizations, and we see a lot of research supporting this, is win rates are plummeting. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it used, uh, I, you know, I kind of cruelly say 
when I was a sales executive, I used to fire people who had less than a 35% win rate. Right. Today, I'm seeing average win rates around 20%. I have work, am working with a client who a year ago, their win rate was, it's a multi-billion dollar company, their win rate was 17%. Mm -hmm. And so now if you think of our classical way of managing that, we say more top of funnel. Yeah. But if you start thinking about it, the highest impact that I can have in driving revenue and driving revenue growth is trying to figure out how do I move from 17% to 30% to 40% that changes everything. It changes the dynamics around how much I have to get to fill my pipeline. It, it changes our revenue growth outlook and changes everything. And I think too much is we started out, we have this playbook that we kind of are tunnel vision on and we apply the same thing. Where right now the, this framework gives you the idea of saying, where do I tweak? Do I tweak the pipeline? Do I tweak our prospecting? Do I tweak our buying process, selling process? I'll give you an, an example that we did in our company. Um, in our company, we have about 15 kind of seller deliverers, people who uh, I, I say look kind of like me, they look better than me, but we do similar things. Is And um, we happen to be fairly high performers. Our average deal size is usually around a million dollars and our win rates are somewhere between 82 and 89%. You know, so, so if I start looking at saying, how am I going to grow the company? Um, and you start saying, well, gee, you know, everybody's, you know, doing really well. We're very effective. I have to start hiring people and so on and so forth. And I'm, you know, I'm cheap. I don't want to hire a lot of people. So we started looking at the sales execution framework and we said, what if we start reducing sales cycle? Our sales cycle is somewhere 12 to 15 months on these big deals. And we start saying, well, we're not sure we can move our customers much faster, but we discovered an interesting piece of data. We discovered it took us an average of 22 meetings to close. Mm. So now you go down to this meeting management piece and you start saying, what if I could reduce the average number of meetings to close? Mm -hmm. And so we started looking at saying, how do we redesign meetings? to have a much higher impact so that we can have fewer and fewer meetings. Well, we did this work about 15 years ago. Today, our average meetings to close is nine. Oh, wow. So we have basically doubled our productivity. So that frees up time yeah. for us to go out and develop new business. So we've essentially been able to, without any change in headcount, any change in investment or anything like that, been able to double our productivity just by redesigning our meetings. But it's had another really important derivative impact is now we're making our clients much more effective and much more efficient. So, so one is they love having us come in in their buying process to help them think because we accomplish more in each meeting mm. and they get, th they actually are reducing their buying cycle. We found their buying cycle now has gone down from 12 to 15 months to nine to 12 months. Mm. So that's provided another kicker for us. And the other thing is because they like our process so much is our win rates have gone up and it's, it's, you know, it's a small amount because we had such high win rates anyway, but yeah. you can start seeing how, if you start looking at one thing and tweaking it, it all of a sudden starts having impacts in the rest of this, this framework. So, so let me ask you a couple quick questions, Dave, while we're, while we're on that thought. It, you talked about reduction in number of meetings from 22 down to nine. Talk about like, what did you change? Was it you know, more, more, uh, was it getting more people into the room? Was it longer meetings? I, you know. so, so it, so it was a, a couple of things. One is it wasn't longer meetings, but it was getting more people into the room yeah. and more of the right people. And the way I had kind of been trained to sell 
particularly in large deals, is I used to go around to all the people involved in the buying process. And you know, right now we know there's somewhere around 11 people involved in the buying process. And I'd go down around to each one of them individually, getting them to nod their heads in the right direction. Uh, and they did that. When they get together, not everybody would be nodding their heads in the right direction. So we'd have to recycle and recycle and, and keep going. And that's what drove all the meetings. So now we've started finding gaining and maintaining consensus is a real challenge. Yeah. It's a real challenge to the customers and their buying process, independent of who the seller is. And so what we do is we start doing more group meetings and we've applied design thinking to this thing. So we say, let's get together and look at these issues together. And we walk out of the room in unison with where we are, what we agree on and what the next steps are. So, so, and the customers struggle with that themselves. So they see a lot of value in doing these things. They see a lot of value in us kind of guiding them through the process. It reduces the number of meetings to close. The other thing is we are, have pretty high expectations of our prospects in their buying process. So, you know, when, when typically for us, when we go to a meeting or today we do a lot more virtually, but, but when we go to a meeting, we have to jump on an airplane, fly someplace, stay in a hotel, run a meeting and come back. And so that gets both time consuming and expensive. So we started adopting the attitude is we're coming to this meeting really well prepared. Mm. We expect you to be as prepared as we are. Yeah. And so there's a lot of pre-meeting planning. And again, what it sounds like this is really tough and aggressive, but customers love it because they're struggling so much with what to do. They really want that guidance. And what it's, again, it's doubled our productivity it's improved our win rate. It's improved the trust that we have with customers. I, I you know, I, I think you touched on a point there that is really important. Uh, and, you know, I think m plenty of great sales leaders know this. So I'm probably not saying anything to the group that they don't already recognize. But mm -hmm. most buyers want to be driven through a process. Yeah. And I think like, some of the mistakes that I see, you know, early leaders uh, making uh, or early sales reps making, uh, and then young leaders sort of allowing to happen is, you know, AEs in an attempt to, I think, be very empathetic to, to their prospects, they will say things like, well, what would you like to do next? Or how would this be best for you? Instead of taking the tone, which I like when I'm in a buying cycle, and I've bought a lot of software over the years, let me suggest that we do this. I suggest that this would be our next step. And I think that that, that like helps push things forward because in a lot of cases, buyers, especially when we're talking to earlier stage companies who maybe are buying a product from a category for the first time, they don't really know how to buy and they don't really know how to evaluate. And so I think like by sort of taking the proactive step of saying, let me suggest we do this. And I suggest you bring these two people into the next meeting. It really helps that buyer understand how to move themselves through the process. Because the last thing any of us want to do when we're buying a new product or solution is we don't want to be cooped up in a, you know, nine month sales cycle. You know, if we've got a problem that we're trying to solve through, through a, a software or a service, we want to get to that solution. We want to get it enabled. We want to get onboarded. We want to get it going. And the whole sales process can be very taxing. So if 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 you as an AE know the cheat code on how to get me through through that faster, by all means, share it with me. Exactly. Exactly. So let me give another example that we're actually seeing a huge amount of success with some of our clients right now. And it kind of, again, the pipeline and the data behind the pipeline is a, often a really good starting point. So this is this is a client that, you know, I had actually introduced them to my good friend, Matt Dixon, and Matt and Ted wrote uh, The Jolt Effect, which is so powerful. And we talked about this 60% no decision made. And I've been talking to the executive team. I said, you know, why are you spending so much time top of the pipeline you know, going out trying to find more prospects to make your numbers when you're squandering 60% of your qualified opportunities. Yeah. What would happen 
if you could start reducing that 60%, I, I, it's an Australian client, I said, what, what, what would happen if you could reduce that 60% to 45% in the next year? Yeah. And so we took that, so one is we had that data point and we started seeing what were the actual no decision made opportunities that they were competing in. And we started going through analyzing what was happening. And a lot of it was really well aligned with what Matt and Ted said in Jolt Effect. And so what that caused us to do is from the pipeline, we moved to the buying selling process. And we started doing two things. One is we started better defining our ICP and tightening up our qualification criteria. But two is because of this uncertainty people feel as they're going through the buying process, we changed the, particularly the discovery stage of the process. Mm -hmm. And here's how their salespeople go in, is they go in and they don't talk about their solution at all. Customer may ask them, they say, well, we do these things, but let's talk about your problem. And yeah. what they do is they focus exclusively on the problem and what the customer is trying to do. And what they're doing is trying to help the customer define their problem, to characterize it, to really kind of shape what the problem is, shape what they need to learn and shape what they want to try and achieve. Um, and so what's happening is they're getting this greater certainty, greater confidence in what they're doing as they go through that process. And at some point, the, the customer says, can you help us? And that's that transition point that says, now let me start presenting the solution. Mm -hmm. So what you, what you would expect in that is, one is you'd expect win rates to skyrocket because of the trust you're building. Yeah. And that's, that's really good. So we're reducing no decision made. But the thing that we found is it reduces sales cycle by about 30%. Mm -hmm. And the reason it does, if you think back to the old Gartner spaghetti diagram, mm -hmm. you know, customers get lost in their buying journey and they wander back and forth, they reset, they change and so on and so forth. And a lot of this is what drives that no decision made. They just get exhausted yeah. and so on. So now that we're taking them through a discipline process focused on their problem, they have greater confidence in what they're doing and time to decision is actually about 30% less than that spaghetti diagram. So we've, we've started doing some interesting things, really changing, reducing no decision made in, in, in the case of this, this client, uh, improving win rate, and win rate, these are all, they were pretty good at selling anyway, but we're improving win rate. But what we've done is we've reduced their sales cycle by 30% and their time to revenue by 30%. Yeah. So and that's so it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting strategy. And the reason why I say it's interesting is the way go-to-market has shifted, the way buying behavior has shifted. And I've i I've, I've seen kind of the steady uptick over the course of the last 12-ish years of my career where more and more the buyer's expectation when they hop on that first phone call is they're like, I just want to see the product. Yeah. I, don't want, I just want to see the product. What, what are you recommending to the teams that you're working with? Or what are you seeing that's working out in the market you know, to sort of stave that off and, and say like, well, hold on a second, you know, before we you know, make our way to the altar, like, let's go on a, you know, let's get to know each other a little bit. And there's no magic solution to that, but but it, it's it's some somehow we get you know what we're hearing, what we want to hear is the buyers say, "Tell me more about your product," because then we can launch into our pitch. Yeah. But but what we really want to do is we want to you know explain to the customer, "I'm glad to tell you more about our product," but so I can position what we do and how we'll help you yeah. in a much better context. Let's first talk about you. Yeah. And this is this is why we want to talk to uh, learn about you, because our product has lots of capabilities, blah, blah, blah. But what we want to do is we really want to understand what you're trying to achieve. We want yeah. to help you understand what you're trying to achieve. And now we then we can position 
how our solution does it better. And so, so we have to be, we have to be, I, I hate to use it because it's so trite, we have to kind of slow the customer down because we trained them to ask us about our product. We have to slow the customer down and we have to slow our instincts down so that we can reshape this. And actually, again, the results that we see is that it goes much faster. The reason I'd like to come back to this framework is so often we tend to be, we and our customers tend to be really kind of tunnel vision in the way we look at it. And we keep going back to the same old playbook and that's not working. And, and what we have to do is start analyzing where can we look at the data? Where can we start? And actually what you find is, is the ripple effects into other parts of what you do is really insightful and helps you really kind of transform everything. So, so we like people to look at kind of how do all these pieces parts fit together yeah. Now I can trace the ripple effects. And now I can start understanding different ways to tweak uh, the organization yeah. and tweak what we do or tweak what I do with an individual in coaching them. That makes sense. I think in general, it's like if you can understand where the problem is stemming from or you can understand where the levers are in the process, you know, you can achieve whatever outcome you're looking for, whether that's yep. bigger deal sizes, faster deal sizes, or a higher win rate. Yeah. And so, so, so often is, is a lot of it too, is, is like, you know, how do I improve my win rate? Well, the fastest way to improve your win rate is to do, a, is to one vicious, uh, focus viciously on your ICP. Yeah. And to do a better job of disqualification. So then as you start doing that, then it takes you back into your kind of segment prioritization and your customer targeting and saying, how well do we understand the ICP or has our ICP changed? Yeah. And, and what as become the qualification criteria. And as an advisor to, to many of the scale uh, portfolio companies, I can tell everybody who's in sales here, this is the number one conversation that I'm having with your marketing leaders, which is let's hone in on our core ICP. Let's do a little bit less experimentation outside of wondering whether or not we can expand into new markets, because right now we want to sell to that core buyer and we want to get more of that buyer. Even if we're getting less in general, we're getting more of that buyer into the top of the funnel, whether it's making its way into an SDR's queue or a salesperson's pipeline. And, and the governing thing that we look at around this is time to results. Mm. So how do we reduce time to results? Um, you know, and for instance, in kind of the area that we were discussing is is the fastest way to improve your win rate. We can we can drive huge changes in results within about three to six months. The fastest way to improve your win rate is number one, better focus on your ICP to make sure everybody's going out so you clean your pipeline of all that crap yeah. that, that doesn't fit. And then number two is, is disqualify your customers. Hmm. Not qualify them, disqualify them. You know, they may not, they're not customers now. They don't want to be customers now. So let's nurture them. Let's move them up in the pipeline and nurture them. But let's focus those on people that need to make a change now. And let's help them navigate through that. So we can drive huge increases in win rate in a very short period of time just by getting a disciplined focus on that. Yeah. Then you start saying the next thing is how do I grow? It's interesting as we've started applying this over the years, we do find some fundamental truths. The, the change that drives fastest time to results is win rate. The second change that drives time to results is increasing average deal size. Mm -hmm. um, and then sales cycle is a little bit, it takes a longer time to tune and sometimes you can't tune it very much at all. Uh, you can do things like we looked at to say, well, the customer decision cycle won't change a whole bunch and we don't have a whole lot of influence on that. 
but how do we reduce the amount of time we spend during that 12 to 15 months? Yeah. And Dave, you're, uh, you, you, you went to analog there. There we go. Oh. Yeah. No, you're good. Okay. Good. Any, I don't know, do you have any more questions, Matt, or do we, do you want to open, do we dare open this up to the audience and see if there are any questions that they might have? Well, I, I think we dare, but I have, I, I just have one quick question for you. You know, I think, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we're seeing very, you know, kind of broadly across the market is there's a, there's a reduction in sales development. Right. There's there like it, we're talking sheer numbers. Right. And so for a lot of sales organizations who are dependent upon, you know, SDR teams to to build their pipeline for them uh, or marketing teams who are operating with reduced budget or at the very least flat budgets this year to, to build their pipeline for them. Like, are you you know, I know, I know we talked about kind of salesperson A with a 40 percent win rate and salesperson B with a 20 percent win rate. But like, are you seeing in general, more salespeople doing their own prospecting? Is that increasing, decreasing? What are you recommending to the organizations that you're working with? We're seeing a couple of changes uh, and some are, are fairly profound changes. One is, is we're seeing more and more going to full cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a, 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 a salesperson that's responsible from the time a lead comes in or responsible for a certain amount of outbound, generating that business, qualifying it and carrying it through full cycle. So we're seeing that increase with SDRs decreasing a little bit. The other thing that we're seeing, and this really comes from kind of the, the overall thing of is the question is outbound dead. Yeah. We're seeing the rise of deep expertise mm. uh, and in presenting that expertise in various different ways, presenting that expertise, we're actually seeing a rise in conferences and trade shows. We're seeing a rise in deep expertise on say LinkedIn or through social channels and things like that because what customers are craving is not somebody that can pitch them a solution, but they're craving deeper understanding. Yeah. And so when we get that deeper understanding, it's people going out talking about business issues. Yeah. It's not talking about how great the products are. And, and the deeper the expertise that we have is, um, is actually the better the reception we get, the better inbound we drive. And so an example, I, I've been controversial in the past. Uh, I did a speech down at uh, UTD for uh, Dr. Howard Dover, and he had a, a group of several hundred executives in and, and students and all that. And um, I said, my strategy around SDRs was a little bit different than most people's strategy. Uh, I'd hire SDRs and pay them 500,000 a piece. Mm. And, you know, people said, you can't pay SDRs 500,000 a piece. They're, you know, 60, 80,000, maybe 100,000 OTE or something like that. It just doesn't work. And I said, well, my SDRs needed to meet with the president of Boeing Commercial Aircraft or meet with uh, the chief design engineer of General Motors or meet with these level people, senior level executives, so the SDRs I had needed to be very deep and very known for their expertise such that the president of Boeing Commercial Aircraft would want to meet with them and learn from them. Yeah. And people said, well, just, you know, it still doesn't work. And I said, well, you know, in two years, I had four SDRs that I paid $500,000 each. They built a $30 billion pipeline and we closed 22 billion of that. Hmm. And so the cost of those 500,000 SDRs was less than 0.1% yep. of sales. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing now, particularly as, as traditional outbound is not working and inbound isn't producing the value, value we're looking at customers are craving 
business expertise and problem expertise and in, in getting that out in front of them, whether it's at trade shows, whether it's through events that you run, whether it's through social, is really driving the interest and in inbound uh, that we want. Yeah, you know, years ago when I worked at Marketo, we always said, you know, we wanted to educate the market. We wanted people to see us as a, the the sort of the leaders in thought, you know, the thought leaders, I should say, of of uh, uh, of marketing going forward. And when they were ready to make a purchase, it would only be natural for them to purchase from us. Now we ran a very similar. Uh, uh, motion as as HubSpot did, kind of catering to different audiences. And then it felt like it was years before I saw it again. And I saw it again in Gong's go to market, which yep. was, let's just be thought of as the absolute smartest people in the room when it comes to sales. Here's what you should say. Here's what you shouldn't say. Here's five phrases that if you say you know, in the course of discovery will increase your win rate by X percent, blah, 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 blah. Spectacular content. And I think, you know, when you look at a product like Gong versus a product like Chorus, uh, before Chorus was acquired by Zoom Info, you know, they look the same. But it was like, no, I want to be, I, why would I buy from anybody other than people who are the clear experts in the space? And, you know, that was, that was orchestrated and that was well thought out. And it was, you know, it was a plan, it was, you know, it's a company-wide plan that they executed against. But I see no reason why it also can't happen at a smaller scale, you know, for sales reps to just be putting themselves out there and 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 presenting themselves as thought leaders. What are your thoughts see, on that? Well, and see, that's the exact thing that we're seeing uh with this this client in Australia right now is is the sales reps are going out there and they're helping the customer educate themselves, but it's about the product. You know, mm. it's it's so interesting that my experience of looking from the outside at Marketo is I always recognized it that they're educating the market yeah. first. And, and it's interesting to see John's uh, uh, article posted this Monday where he's coming out and educating the market about things have changed, we need a new playbook, what does it mean? Yeah. Um, and he's not, and, and what's happened is all of us started looking at educating the market. It changed from educating the market about their issues to educating the market about our product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so if we keep going back to what stands in the way of customers being really interested in our product, is they aren't educated about the issues yes. that need to change. And so in, in this case, and you know, whether we have, I have my $500,000 experts going out there educating the market and educating executives, or I have my, the salespeople in Australia going out and saying, I am not going to talk about my solution until you have great confidence that you've educated yourself in all the issues around your, that you're trying to address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time talking about kind of the left side of this, mm -hmm. uh, of this process. I want to, I want to fast forward all the way to the right side of this process, because this is something that I'm hearing about a lot, which is, gosh, how do I even forecast at this point? You know, how do, how, do I, how, how do I apply a level of rigor to the way I think about when a deal is going to close, uh, how much a deal is going to close for when I'm operating in an environment where there's layoffs, there's, you know, re reduction in, in budgets. How, how do I get a little bit more, you know, maybe quote unquote hardcore in the way I look at my, my pipeline and when it's going to close and what it's going to close for? So, uh, you know, the only answer I can do is say it depends, but here's some, yeah. some things is, is that, you know, I have right now I'm working with a basic material supplier is, is, you know, and they provide, you know, they provide tanker trucks full of tanker cars full of things that they ship to their customers and their customers 
use that in manufacturing products and, and things like that. Fortunately, none of them went to Pennsylvania or, or through Ohio. <laughs> but anyway, they, they, they provide those things. So part of this is the forecasting is really one of, uh, you have two forecasting problems is forecasting winning the order versus forecasting revenue. And yeah. revenue is is how do we start getting into quarterly, you know, uh, annual kinds of planning, particularly when it means a lot in terms of their supply chain management and all that. And there you look at a lot of trend analysis and we're seeing some really great AI tools yeah. coming out to really help better project those kinds of things. But if I start looking at kind of the discrete buying, um, so much of what we're doing in 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 forecasting right now is really wrong is one is is we forecast things based on where they are in the pipeline and all we're measuring in the pipeline is progress through the pipeline not customer commitment to buy yeah you know so when we're looking at forecasting we really have to to look at you know what's the customer commitment to buy so we have to ask them we have to have an indication from the customer um you know, I have a profound need to change. I need to have a change in place by this date. And here are the consequences of my not making that change. Yeah. And until the customer says that, you have no ability to forecast. Yeah. So, so you put that in place. And, and the forecast is really based on a deal and we look at the total forecast as the aggregation of deals. Yeah. Um, and, and you can drive high accuracy. I have one client right now that's doing that. They have 92% accuracy because they drive that customer commitment. Um, and, you know, and, and, um, and all it's really good. I think I had one client uh, two years ago who was always meeting their forecast. Say so they were forecasting, we'll do uh, $2 billion this quarter. As I got under the forecast and looked at what they forecast at the beginning and what came out at the end is 27% of what they forecast actually came in. 37% of what they forecast they lost. And the rest, they went through unnatural acts of moving things in, finding something and so on and so forth. So the, the CRO was, actually a little bit annoyed when I came in and presented the data and I said, you're underperforming your potential, even though you're making your, your gross number of $2 billion, look at the fact that you're forecasting and 37% you lose. How can you forecast to win that and you lose it? Look yeah. at, you have this ability to make your number by pulling in this stuff. So you should be performing at a much higher level than you're actually performing. And you should consider that unacceptable. And, and so they started changing their mindset around that and started improving kind of one, the forecast integrity, but, but the, you know, because they were paying so much attention to the number, but what not what caused that number, they were missing opportunities to grow really at a double the rate they should have been growing. They had been growing. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, uh, creating a little bit of exposure for themselves in subsequent quarters when they're when they're pulling deals in a little bit early. Well, you know, you, you found these people are always scrambling, and then you started seeing margins go down because they were discounting to pull yeah. things, and so there are all these kind of flow through effects um, that you you know we just get caught up in the day to day of achieving our goals, but we forget we miss some of the things that we're doing to achieve our goals and how we might more effectively achieve them. Yeah, and as an empathetic marketer, what I will say is the, you know, the day-to-day -day of achieving our goals is also, you know, how we stay employed. So, yeah. you know, I certainly, I certainly understand the, the, the pressure and the, and the need to, to get to those numbers, but, um, uh, but I also understand like, you know, these are, these are the things when you talk about where are the, the where's the source of the ripple and then how does it impact you know, our, our, our sort of sales metrics. Well, if you got to pull in a bunch of stuff from Q3 into Q2, you're probably going to have to discount it, right? So that's going to reduce our average sale price. 
It may expose us in terms of you know what our our our, our pipeline coverage is in the subsequent quarter. Uh, but once you understand that this is the action that we had to take in order to hit that quarter, then you understand how that change impacts you know the further stages or 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 the the overall business metrics that we're using to 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 quantify to and quantify I, sales. And I think it's human nature to get caught up in the day to day. And you know, as a leader, I want my people caught up in the day to day. But every right. once in a while, we have to take one or two steps back and kind of start looking at the whole picture yeah. and say, you know, where do we tweak? What do we do? to start driving performance. And again, if you have a framework like this or some other kind of framework, it allows you to put some structure to it to start understanding if I tweak here, what will happen over there and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think we have we have time for one last question uh, here, Dave. And it's a it's maybe I should have given this one to you earlier because it's a big one, but uh, we'll, we'll try and get through it here with the, with the last few minutes. Um, there has been an emergence of the CFO into, you know, uh, in, into the, the the buying process, much more so than than what we've seen, you know, in sort of previous years. And it's only natural given that people are trying to to save capital as much as possible. You know, what are what should we be enabling our reps uh, to do, knowing that at some point, you know, a CFO is more than likely going to come, you know, peeking into into their deals. I, I think you're, you're hitting on one of the biggest issues we see in sales performance right now is business and financial acumen, um, and all, which is saying we have to be able to talk the same language our customers are talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't have the business acumen to be able to engage them in thinking about their problems and where they want to take their business, we aren't going to be as successful as, as we could be if we don't have the financial acumen to be able to talk to them about the financial impact on um, their organization uh, and how they how they might pay for this, how they might fund it, source of funding, you know, what cash flow might be and all those kinds of things, then we're going to not be able to close as many deals as possible. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I was doing um, um, it, it came up in a conversation. I was doing a talk to about 300 salespeople and I asked them the question at the end of my talk. I said, how many of you this was for very complex B, B2B stuff? I said, how many of you in the last six months have looked at a 10K, a 10Q, a proxy statement or something like that? Yeah. to help you develop a strategy to sell to your customers. And only five people raise their hands. Sure. And so, you know, to me, that's one of the greatest sources of, of trying to identify where we might be able to help customers, particularly in these tough financial times, is they're going to be concerned about business return. And if we can't somehow connect the dots to the business impact, they're going to defer the decision. And a lot of times, you know, we've always expected the customers to do that, but a lot of times they themselves don't know how to do that. Yeah, and I think, I, I think you're bringing up a, a very important point. When you're selling to a public company, if you're showing up as a salesperson and asking them about their strategic initiatives, what are your strategic initiatives? They're listed in a quarterly 10K report. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when you want to talk about expanding a customer if you can utilize the strategic initiatives outlay outlined in their 10k report or in an earnings call and tie your product or your service directly to whatever that massive strategic initiative is it not only builds trust uh it not only you know uh, uh builds a business case for your product but it also gives that person you know, visibility and exposure within their own organization to say, hey, I'm bringing this on because it's in support of X. Exactly. And see, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of our clients have real success right now is we're saying, you know, look at if they're a public company, look at their 10K. If they're a private company, there are other ways you can get sure. or approximate uh, that information. But, you know, we're saying, 
you know, typically that shows the top uh, executives priorities and initiatives in terms of where they're driving the company. Now we say, how do you connect the dots between those top executives expectations down somewhere lower in the organization to where we're impacting? Yeah. But it's amazing if you can start connecting those dots, even though you have a very small impact on the overall corporate objectives, is you're more likely to get your product, your, your offering supported and the customer is going to get the funding that they need to move forward with that. If you aren't doing that, the customer is going to have to do it themselves. If they don't do it themselves, guess what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dave, I, I think we got to leave it there. Uh, we're starting to have people jump off to go to their 11 o'clock meetings. Uh, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Specifically, I want to thank Dave Brock for being here. Um, I'm so thrilled that I got to spend an hour with you today. I know I speak on behalf of, of our guests as well. If people want to get a hold of you, Dave, what's the best way for them to get a hold it's, of you? Yeah, my email address. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You know, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, and uh, um, you know, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, great. And if you guys want to learn a little bit more about this process, if you want us to to do the the uh, to to connect the dots between you and Dave, um, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, uh, Robert wasn't here today, but I was, so you can get me at Matt at scale VP, or you can, uh, get mine and Dave's favorite person, Craig Rosenberg at Craig at, Craig at scale VP.com. And, well. and I provided uh, Robert, we wrote a, a little white paper kind of going into a lot more detail around this uh, sales execution framework. I, I think, you know, Robert and Craig and, and hopefully you will make that available to all the people or Absolutely. reach out to me and I'm glad to send it to you. Absolutely. Dave, thanks so much. Have a wonderful Thursday and a wonderful weekend. We'll talk to you soon. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to chatting with you soon. Take care. Well, it's been such a privilege. Thanks, Matt. I really enjoyed it. You bet.